Welcome back to Your Health Radio and Program. I'm Dr. David Morwood. I am a board-certified plastic surgeon, and I'm so pleased you could be with us for this very special edition of Your Health Radio and Television Program. Today, we're discussing the eye and associated structures. My next guest is the distinguished Leland H. Rosenblum, physician and surgeon, expert of the eye. Dr. Rosenblum, thank you very much for being here today. Thank you for having me. Dr. Rosenblum, before we get started to talk about the cataract, which is a very important issue, I think our audience is very interested in that, I want to learn a little bit about the training for an ophthalmologist. Besides being real smart and having steady hands, who gets into the ophthalmology training program and what is it like? Well, first of all, you have to love the eye. But uh, ophthalmology is approached through uh, medical school, so oftentimes it's a misconception that ophthalmologists don't go to medical school. We do um, four years of college, four years of medical school, uh, general medical training for a year, either in internal medicine or surgery, and then after that, uh, three or four years in ophthalmology training, and then beyond that, if you're doing a subspecialty, uh, one or two years beyond that. Perfect. Now, so, Dr. Rosenblum, what is that residency training in, in the eye like? Do you guys operate? Is it classroom? Is it working in the hospital, working in the clinic? Well, what's the residency for ophthalmology like? Well, residency for ophthalmology is very much hands-on training. So there are didactics that happen, um, lectures uh, with distinguished professors. Um, most residency programs are associated with universities. Um, so certainly uh, lecturing, learning, but a lot of it's hands-on, examining patients with uh, world-renowned specialists and then learning to do surgery one step at a time until you're exceptionally competent. Excellent. Dr. Rosenblum, I noticed reviewing your resume, and by the way, you have a very impressive resume. I'm so glad you could join us today and take a few moments to teach our audience that you have a number of publications. In other words, some of your research and investigations have actually been summarized and published in medical journals. Yes. So let's take a moment to teach our audience what that means when a doctor publishes an article in a medical journal. Well. Um, when I was in training, I had a number of research interests, both in um, uh, blood vessels and also the eye. And so a lot of my ch research was done on that. And basically, it, uh, some of it was lab work, where we were uh, analyzing uh, various molecular structures and deciding if they had an impact. And some of it was clinical work, where you examine people who have various different conditions, and then you summarize those findings, hopefully so everyone can make the same advances and observations that you have. Excellent. Well, I think it's, it's truly a feather in your cap to be able to have some of your research and some of your findings not only summarized but published so other doctors can read it and review it. Okay. Um, Dr. Rosenblum, the main part of this segment, what I would like to do is teach the audience about the lens and about cataracts. Now, I believe that at one time, and it may still be true, that a cataract operation is certainly one of the most common operations performed in the United States. Isn't that correct? That's true. Actually, uh, cataract surgery, I believe, is the most common surgery performed on Medicare recipients, so people age 65 and older. Okay. So what I'd like to do, and I know we have a teaching model here, if we can just briefly go layer by layer and identify the major parts of the anatomy of the eyeball and then I want to zero in on the lens and we're going to talk about what a cataract actually is. Certainly. Well, we have a model here of the human eye. Uh, this is the front. This is the back. Light is traveling this way and will pass right through this central opening. So light is first going to hit this structure here, which is called the cornea, which is a clear window. So, we'll so, so, so excuse me. So that's the very front part of the eye. That's the, the clear part. Clear part. At, at the most anterior part of the eyeball. Exactly. Okay. And that's the cornea. That's the cornea. And uh, the cornea acts as a clear protection for the front of the eye. Light will then pass through what's called the anterior chamber, which is a fluid-filled structure filled with aqueous humor. It will then pass through a round opening, which is called the pupil. And the pupil is made by the iris, which is the colored part of the eye. Everyone always looks at eye color. And the dark hole in the center there is called the pupil. Okay, so, so Dr. Rosenblum, we oftentimes equate the eyeball with a camera. Mm -hmm. Isn't that correct? Correct. So, so, so the cornea might be like a glass shield correct. on the camera. And the iris, it might be like the diaphragm. It's correct? exactly like the diaphragm of the camera. It, it might constrict when the light is bright and it might dilate when it's dark out. Accurate, very accurate. Okay, so, so light comes through the cornea mm -hmm. and then through the opening, what we call the pupil, but it's the opening in the iris. Correct. Right, and then comes what? Then comes a, a structure called the human lens, and the lens sits right behind the iris or the colored part of the eye. 
And this lens uh, is normally clear, transparent. It's made of proteins that are aligned in such a way that they're perfectly clear. Uh, after it hits this lens, it'll be focused on the back of the eye, which we call the retina. We had a previous uh, retina expert here, Dr. Eric Del Piero, who was talking all about the retina. Okay, perfect. So, so this is really fascinating to me, Dr. Rosenblum. So a camera lens can actually focus, correct? Correct. Well, well can the human lens focus at all? Is it, is it a dynamic structure or does it just sit there? Absolutely. Uh, the human lens is very dynamic, uh, but it stiffens as we age. So we all know that we can focus on things earlier in life, but as we get older, that lens gets stiffer and sometimes we need glasses for focusing up close. Okay, so, so what is it that, that makes the lens focus? Is, does it have a muscle around it or support? structures? The lens is attached to the wall of the eye by fine little fibers, which we call zonular fibers. And those fibers are then attached to a muscle, which is called the ciliary body. And the contraction of that ciliary body and the uh, pressure it puts on those fibers allows the lens to change shape. So, okay, so, so if I have something right here in front of me, uh, the, the, does the lens take a, a slightly different shape than if I'm focusing on something far away? Absolutely. And that dynamic change allows you to change your focus from far away to up close. And, and that just does it, uh, I mean, it's automatic. I don't have to think about focusing mm. on something far away as opposed to something here. No, your brain automatically does that. Well, Dr. Rosenblum, it's true the eye is amazing. It's wondrous, don't you think? I think it's an amazing organ, absolutely. <laughs> okay, so I, I like these segments where I learn a lot. So, so again, back to the lens. You said that in youth it's pliable and kind of stretchy and ultra clear. Mm -hmm. And as we grow older, it becomes stiffer. It becomes stiffer and it can lose its transparency. Okay, so what exactly is a cataract? Well, a cataract refers to a loss of transparency of this lens, which is normally clear. Uh, the most common causes of cataracts is, is aging, where the lens loses its transparency um, um, through the slow process of aging, which is called oxidization inside the eye. But a cataract can happen at any point in time. Uh, children can be born with cataracts. Uh, they can develop early in life, uh, or they can develop later in life. Uh, but the most common form is definitely age-related. And what happens is, as this lens stiffens and loses its transparency, light will then have some difficulty being focused inside the eye. Okay, so, so it's like having a dirty lens on a camera. Exactly. I mean, it's a cloudy structure that we want to be completely translucent. Mm -hmm. It becomes cloudy Correct. and potentially stiff. And so images don't pass clearly through it, or light doesn't pass clearly through light, it. Light is getting scattered and not focused clearly. Okay, so what are the symptoms that someone may be developing a cataract? What, what do they come in and say? Well, one of the early signs of a cataract can just be a frequent change in your need for glasses. Because as this lens gets stiffer and changes its consistency, it can just cause your need for glasses to change. So if you're going through a lot of glasses changes, it might be that you're developing a cataract. It's creating changes in the way light is bent inside the eye. Other changes would be um, seeing halos around light, okay? A lot of glare problems when people drive, especially with headlights and driving at night. Uh, it can cause uh, difficulty watching TV just because the TV image can't be focused. Difficulty reading because uh, you can't resolve fine print anymore. Okay, Dr. Rosenblum, d does everyone get cataracts if they live long enough or just certain familial tendencies, it runs in families or certain occupations, certain ethnic groups? Who gets cataracts? Well, again, the most common cause is age-related, and you know, better than 90% of people over the age of 60, at some point at that time over 60, will start to have a little bit of a cataract. So the question is not so much is the lens losing a little bit of its transparency and its pliability, uh, but what the eye is able to see through that. So as long as the eye is functioning relatively normally and people see clearly, even if the lens has lost some of its transparency and is creating some mild problems, we would say we would just watch that problem. Okay, so, so at what point do you suggest intervention or treatment for a cataract? Well, I usually say that the patient will let me know. Okay, so uh, there used to be this uh, thought that we would wait for cataracts to ripen, okay? And people always come and say, is my cataract ripe? And I say, because I remember when my grandmother had cataract surgery, we had to wait for them to be ripe to get to be removed. Um, in days when cataract surgery was uh, more difficult to recover from, uh, we used to wait till the vision loss used to be quite severe. Uh, now we wait until uh, the vision is causing pro significant problems with what people would want to do with their activities of daily life. They don't feel safe driving a car. They don't feel safe tracking their golf ball on the golf course, okay? They're, they don't feel they can read. Uh, they can't watch the TV the way, the way they used to. Okay. So 
what do we do about it? Let's say someone comes in and says they're frustrated by their lack of clear vision. They feel they can't do everything what they want to do in life. What do we do about it? Well, let's first talk a little bit about prevention. So if someone comes in and they have the early stages of a cataract, we might say we're going to do really nothing except watch it, try and change your glasses, get you the best possible prescription we can. Um, and recommend that you wear some protection against the harmful sun rays. So ultraviolet light probably is causative of cataracts. We also get a lot of questions about is there a pill I can take or is there a drop I can take? Is there something that can reverse it? And the short answer to that is no. There have been a lot of studies looking at supplements and although they work for other eye conditions like macular degeneration, they really haven't been shown convincingly to change what cataracts do. There also are some eye drops advertised out on the web that will say we'll relieve the symptoms and reverse cataracts, but really there's no study that would promote their use on a large basis. Okay, so in summary, if when someone's cataract gets bad enough, then surgery is the treatment. Correct. Okay, so wh what's the surgery like? What do you do for a cataract? Well, surgery is really a, a lens transplant, if you will. So what we're going to do with surgery is remove this clouded lens and put a clear lens in its place. What we're able to do now is use very, very small incisions, so we can do that with a minimal amount of uh, downtime for the patient and very rapid recovery of vision. So in the old days, um, you used to spend about a week in the hospital, uh, had very large sutures in the eye, uh, and end up with very thick glasses after cataract surgery. And it, it was not really a very desirable surgery. Uh, nowadays, we use incisions that are um, smaller than 2.5 millimeters, which is pretty, pretty small. So that's smaller than like the tip of your pen would be. Um, we don't have to use injections for anesthesia. We can just use gels or eye drops for anesthesia. And people can uh, go home that same day and sometimes has useful vision as soon as that night or the morning after surgery. Dr. Rosenblum, I have a question about the mechanics of it. If you make an incision less than three millimeters in length, how do you get the lens in? Well, we have special equipment uh, which we can vacuum out the lens with. So we have special equipment which is ultrasound and we call that phaco emulsification. And it's uh, basically a pen tip which has vacuum and suction and fluid attached to it. And that pen tip re re uh, oscillates very rapidly and we can break up the lens into very small pieces like pieces of a pie and suck them out. So that's what you call phaco. Phaco. Which is short for phaco emulsification. Correct. And that's the process whereby you remove the cloudy stiff lens. Okay, so then what? Well, then we have to replace the lens. Okay. And now we're able to use lenses that can fold up, like uh, a taco. So they fold up in half, and we can get them through very, very small incisions. Uh, so we can get uh, lenses now through incisions as small as two millimeters or even below that. OK, so you mentioned before that the human lens is sort of supported and held in place by some fibrils. Yes. Now, do those fibrils have to be reattached to the new lens, or do they just, what anchors the lens in place? Well, that's an excellent question. Uh, and the nuances of cataract surgery are that the lens is actually surrounded by a clear capsule. And when we do cataract surgery, we preserve that clear lens capsule, and we vacuum it up, polish it up so it's nice and clear, and then in that capsular bag, that little envelope, we unfold our clear lens. We also have now, because we can use lasers that can measure the eye, both in length and curvature, we can be very accurate with our implant lens powers, so we can greatly reduce people's dependence on glasses. Okay, so, so Dr. Rosenblum, the, the lens that you put in, mm -hmm. w is that lens actually capable of focusing at well or as well, or is it just one static focus, f focal length. Okay. It used to be that we only had lenses that were static for one focal length. So we could either set you for distance or we could set you your, your eye to see it near, but not both. Uh, nowadays, or at least for the past six years, we have lenses that can work for both distance and near. So those are called accommodative lenses. There are also other lenses which are called diffractive lenses. And what they do is they allow the, some return of function for both distance and near that your eye used to have before the age of 40. So when we put these specialty lenses in the eyes, uh, we can get about 8 out of 10 people spectacle-free after cataract surgery. That's amazing. So, so Dr. Rosenblum, while we still have time, I want to make sure we get all this in. Um, you, your office is in Monterey. And do you have a Salinas office as well? I do have a Salinas office as okay. well. Okay, and can I give out your phone number? Please. In Monterey, and once again, Dr. Leland H. Rosenblum, R-O-S-E-N-B-L-U-M, 372-1500, that's in Monterey. And in Salinas, it's 
1150. Yes, and if people are interested, we also have a, a website. Uh, there are two websites. Uh, one is www.montereyi.com, and the second is www.montereybayicenter.com. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Now, um, in the, about the two minutes we have left remaining, I want to talk about the mechanics of the operation. Okay. Do they have to stay overnight? Is it general anesthesia, local anesthesia? Is it covered by insurance? Are there specialty lenses that people have to pay extra for? Do, do they come and see you primarily? Do they need a referral? So, so what are the mechanics of having a cataract operation? Uh, well, the mechanics of the cataract operation um, are basically that's outpatient surgery performed under local anesthetic. So. Yeah. At the hospital or surgery center? At a surgical center. So the most common f uh, place we do it is at outpatient surgical centers. And usually you, the operation is very quick. It takes less than a half hour. But people will be at the surgical center probably for a couple hours just getting connected and then unconnected to the surgical center. Uh, we usually start an IV and you'll get some very happy medicine by vein just to take the edge off because anxiety is normal. Uh, we put some drops and some gel on the eye to numb the eye. And then we ask you to relax and sit back and you look at a very bright light, which is actually the light of a microscope. So it's actually like a little kaleidoscope show. <laughs> you can talk to me during surgery or not talk to me. Uh, during surgery, what a patient would feel is just pressure and motion, but no sensation of pain whatsoever. But, but they're awake. But they're awake and okay. they'll talk to me and I'll remind them to look at the light. Okay. A and their eyeball is numbed up. Their eyeball is numbed up, so they have absolutely no pain. Okay. And it takes, you say, about a half an hour? Uh, less than a half hour, typically, okay. to perform. And then they recover, they recover right in the recovery room there, in the PACU, we call it. Yes. And then they go home the same day. And start some eye drops, yes. And it's covered by insurance, Medicare takes care of this. Are there specialty lenses that people sometimes have to pay for? Yeah, well, Medicare will cover, um, and most insurances will cover the standard lens, which, which would work at one distance. We talked about either working for things far away or up close. The specialty lenses that can work for both distance and near, uh, Medicare and insurance companies have chosen not to pay for. Uh, they've said that technology is too expensive. Uh, there also are lenses out that can correct for uh, abnormalities of curvature of the eye, which is called astigmatism, and those lenses are not covered either. But all of those lenses can significantly improve the quality of life and reduce dependence on glasses. Okay, now Dr. Rosenblum, one final question. Now, if someone feels that they may have an eye problem, do they need a referral to see you? Can they call your eye office themselves and make an appointment? How does that work? No, absolutely. We love new patients. So they can call my office directly, 372-1500. Uh, I'm happy to see them. Welcome new patients. You do not need a referral to see me. Excellent. Leland H. Rosenblum, you're board certified eye physician and surgeon here in Monterey, and you have a Salinas office. Dr. Rosenblum, this is fascinating to me. The eye is wondrous, and that you get to do surgery on the, such a wondrous organ. I like plastic surgery, but it's pretty good. What you guys do is pretty good. <laughs> Thank, Thank you for having me. Thanks so very much for being on the program, and I hope you come again. We'll have more time to talk in the future. Please invite me. Thanks so very much. Once again, this is your health radio and television program. I'm Dr. David Morwood. I am a board-certified plastic surgeon. We're coming right back after a very brief pause for a very good cause.